Did you know that a child's brain forms more than one million neural connectors every second of their early childhood years? Research indicates that childhood adversity alters us. It changes the chemistry in our brain. It even has the potential to alter our very DNA. How? Imagine you're walking peacefully along a savanna on a warm summer day, and you startle a lion. Deep in your brain, an alarm sounds, and an intricate system of signals releases stress hormones, cortisol and adrenaline, and you are ready to fight the lion or run from the lion. And that's fantastic if you're on the savanna and there's a lion. But what about if the lion comes home every night? That's what happened to me. I was raised in an intact but incestuous home in Oregon. When my father's contract with the district wasn't renewed, he was a, an elementary school principal, and the church asked him to resign. He was also a pastor. And pressure mounted in the incest probe. We moved to Africa. Now, I thought with the naivety of a young girl that we had been given a second chance. And I loved Africa down to the very dirt of it. It was there that I acquired a pet leopard who became my confidant and alter ego. Her name was Gifty. And there, I found a best friend, an Ethiopian girl named Mulanesh. But he didn't stop, my father. And when there's one form of abuse, there's generally more. It's multi-axial. So Katie, my sister, and I were playing accordions in our room one afternoon when we heard Elsie scream. We raced up to the main house to find her being beaten by Dad. Katie tried to get in the middle of it and separate him, and she was tossed roughly aside. Horrified, she and I both ran. She ran blindly out the compound gate. I snapped a halter on my horse and took off bareback after her. I'd heard about asylum. I heard embassies offered it. And I knew of an embassy, Swedish, pretty near our home. I quickly caught up with Katie, and she used my foot to swing on behind. I kicked my horse, Mingustu, into a gallop, and we approached the embassy had forgotten about that four-foot stone wall that surrounded the embassy, and I did not remember where the gate was, and Elsie was being hurt. Hang on tight, Katie, I shouted over my shoulder. We are jumping that wall. Now, it's a miracle that two teenage girls riding bareback actually did manage to stay on, but we did, and cantered up to the main building where we were listened to, a phone call was made to our home, so we assumed Elsie's beating stopped, but we were returned to our parents. Not the embassy, not the church, not the school. Ultimately, no one in a position of authority came to our aid. It'll come as no surprise, I was a battered wife in my first marriage and part of the Me Too movement, thanks to a pastor. I fought and won a legal battle for the protection of my children against my very own parents. I will be forever grateful to a stellar group of people who mentored me in how to use your brain for change. Because here's what I discovered. The same brain chemistry that can help save a child in the wild can help a child who's experiencing abuse at home. But it comes with a tremendous cost. The system gets activated over and over and over again, and instead of being life-saving, 
its overuse becomes health damaging. Children are particularly sensitive to this because their brains and their bodies are just developing. There were five sisters in my family, and each of us moved into adulthood with a different yet classic reaction response to our childhood. One became an alcoholic, one a prostitute, one barely functional, had a heart, att heart attack at 30 and lost half her heart. One battled deep depression and one had post-traumatic stress. The implications of our childhood experience stretched across our lifetime as indicated in a study conducted by the Center for Disease Control and Kaiser Permanente was called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, or ACES. The study measured 10 types of childhood trauma. And we're not talking about chipping a nail before prom or losing a basketball game. We are talking about life trauma. Most of the participants could cite a score of one. Surprisingly, 67% of the study had a score of four or more. And if you have a score of four or more, you are two and a half times more likely to develop chronic heart disease, a leading killer in the US today, two and a half times more likely to contract hepatitis or lung cancer, four and a half times more likely to develop depression, 12 times more likely to take your own life, with a 20-year reduction in lifespan. My ACEs score, five. And that sounds pretty hopeless, right? Physically speaking, I mean. I'm a walking time bomb. Only that's the beauty of it. Both the science and the psychology of it. For we were designed to heal. Neurologically speaking, you can create new pathways of thought in your brain. And those new pathways govern can help you govern feeling and emotion. I am the sister with post-traumatic stress. I learned in two and a half years of therapy how and when I triggered, and then I retrained my brain about what to do when I trigger. I don't always get it right, but most of the time I do. So that's a managed response, but some responses can be completely eradicated I had cluster migraines as a, young, as a teenager and a young woman. I was neurologically tested and given the medication to handle them when they swooped in. But here is the amazing part to me about the linkage between our mind, our heart, and our body. When I addressed my rage, mm-hmm, rage, not a snit, not a tantrum, not even wholeheartedly angry, no. This was molten lava rage, and I kept it tamped down so hard. The only way it could come out for me was in migraines. When I addressed my rage that my father hadn't valued me enough as a child not to hurt me, rage that my mother didn't protect me, grief that the family I longed for I had never, nor would I ever have, Loss that my ideal of a healthy marriage hadn't worked out. When I addressed my rage, my migraines disappeared. That was 30 years ago, and I haven't had one since. I am not saying that all migraines are unexpressed rage, but mine were. <laughs> we have a vast population in the United States today of adults who were abused as kids. There are 42 million of us, many who have not addressed their pain in a way that could lead to health. But we can. There is hope and healing and adaptation and a remarkably good shot at a victorious life if we do. Healing happens when you're willing to do the work of it. That probably bears repeating. Healing trauma happens when you're willing to do the work of it. But how? 
It's multidisciplinary, mind, body, and spirit. They say that seven is a perfect number, so I'd like to give you seven ideas. One, acknowledge your experience. Stand in your truth. It happened. Two, be willing to allow your very real and appropriate responses to it. It's OK to get angry. In fact, you have to get angry to get well. So you might view your anger as the beginning of a healthy start. Three, choose what you want your life to look like. Are you going to let trauma define you forever? Are you going to overuse the rear view mirror of your life? You can't look forward when you're looking back. Can you find ways to reduce stress? Laugh a little. Maybe not take yourself quite so seriously. Ultimately, it is you, the designer of the life that you want to have. And then four, plan the path to that life you just designed. It takes a village to heal trauma. You might need medical or psychological care. You might want spiritual direction. You might want to develop new or healthier relationships and fire a few of the ones you've got. Five, reclaim your life. Use that prodigious organ, your brain, to reprogram your life Choose to thrive, not just survive, and be willing to do whatever it takes to get there. Six, this one's tough, or tougher. Find the silver lining in your experience. View the injustices that happened to you as a lump of coal that underwent tremendous pressure over a prolonged period of time to become a jewel. And then hold that jewel in your heart as priceless treasure. Because you see, we're not trying to run or erase the memory of our experience. We, we can't do that. We're building a new life because of that experience, on the foundation of it, if you will. For example, you may have deep empathy for another person's pain. It was born out of your own. Or you, you might be highly intuitive. Did wondering which way the wind was blowing in your family become an art form? You can use it to be more aware of others. And seven? Find a way to offer hope to another human being. We who are in this room and those who will watch the talk after the fact, we are the village. We will stand shoulder to shoulder as another beautiful human being learns to walk again. We will listen, love, encourage, and offer hope. We, you or I, will be the one who 20 feet from the finish line of this marathon drops to our knees beside a fallen sister or brother and says, get up, you've got this only 20 more feet. And we, you and I, will dance a victory dance for the one who chose to thrive and went for it. Thank you.